The gates were thrown open as the scouting party returned to the settlement of Stubborn. They didn't usually arrive with such speed. The captain could tell something was wrong. What's the matter, Corporal? They're coming! The Corporal's eyes were wide with panic. They're coming and we have to leave! Everyone needs to leave! Get a grip, Corporal! What did you see? Raiders? Bar the gates and muster the West Wind Riders! We'll send these pigs back to their muddy holes and be done in time for dinner. No! The Corporal maniacally grabbed the Captain by the shoulders. It won't be enough this time. What did you see, Corporal? The Captain broke the Corporal's frozen grip on his shoulders and quickly made his way up to the top of the wall. His face drained of colour as he scanned the horizon. It's... too late to run now. Muster all hands! Man the walls! Prepare for a siege! Get down! The wall suddenly exploded as it was struck by a stone the size of a large cow. They have siege weapons! Where did they get siege weapons? It's not siege weapons. It's trolls with rocks. Tell your rulers there's a new power in the West. What you've called the Barons, we now name Dram. Hello adventurers and welcome to the next installment of Eberron Historian. Today we will be taking an in-depth look at the land, culture, and denizens of the monstrous nation of Dram. Please remember to hit those like and subscribe buttons below if you're enjoying our content, and switch notifications on to stay up to date as we release new episodes in the future. Let's get started. For as long as humans have been established on the continent of Corvair, the lands to the west of the Grey Wall Mountains have been shunned as inhospitable and undesirable. Although humans were settled in the western ends of this land known as the Shadow Marches six centuries before the formation of Galifar, everything in between the Marches and the Grey Wall Mountains has always been known as the Barrens. This vast territory stretches across treacherous mountains and crags to sweeping hostile plains and thick swamps all populated by dangerous beasts and malevolent locals. When the nation of Galifar was founded in 1YK, the province of Brelin was granted rule over all the lands between the Grey Wall and Biesk Mountains to the Thunder Sea at the continent's southern edge. This almost doubled the amount of land coverage that the province had, but it was simply a gesture. The people of Breland were well aware that the barons had little to offer in the way of hospitable land or resources, and it was largely ignored. As the Brelish expanded west over the centuries, Castle Arakane became a popular royal residence, and outlying towns such as Ardev and Shavalant began to expand rapidly. Those places were exposed to the gap between the Grey Wall and Silver Lake, and soon western settlers began to return to central Breland, bringing with them tales of monsters, raiding parties in the night comprised of howling beasts, orcs, goblins, minotaurs, and ogres. In response to an attack on Castle Arakane, Galifar waged a short war, using full force to drive the raiders back across the Grey Wall and securing Western Brelin once again. The fortress Orkbone was built to stand as a sentinel against any more raiders crossing the gap, and the king founded the Westwind Riders, a mobile strike force that could patrol and repel future raiding parties. Brelin's western rim began to prosper once more. Settlers began to stake out claims along the Grey Wall, and the fortress settlement of Stubborn was established west of the Grey Wall. The West Wind Riders held the raiding monsters at bay for nearly a century, but unfortunately for Breland and its western settlers, it was a time of peace that just wouldn't last. As King Jarrett passed away, and tension began to build among his five children over who would take the throne of Galifar, Princess Roan of Breland began to recall most of the nation's western forces back to prepare for war against her siblings. A great many of the Westwind Riders were Andarian, who headed north to serve their home province. Western Breland was now left with only a small defensive retainer. Overconfident, the Brelish crown believed that their western lands were safe. An Andarian spymaster saw an opportunity early in the war to disrupt Breland's western edge and organized to have the Andarian crown send a small force to provide arms and training to the raiding bands of a barren warlord known as Resh Torah. This eventually proved fruitless, as they found the raiders were too wild and undisciplined. It was difficult to bring them together as an organized force, and the operation was abandoned. Against well-fortified towns like Stubborn, 
Baron's raiding parties posed little threat. They had very little coordination, no concept of siege warfare, and certainly lacked the equipment and weaponry to overcome the walls of a fortress. Despite the minimal forces that were left to man the walls throughout the war, Stubborn managed to stand against the raiders of the Barons for decades. That is, until one fateful day in the year 986YK, when Stubborn finally fell. The town's defenders found themselves standing against a fully armed and organized force of monsters. Regiments of orcs and ogres armed with smithed weapons. Enormous trolls armed with boulders acted as makeshift catapults. The attackers acted with tactical efficiency, and Stubborn was taken with little effort. Survivors of the attack were rounded up and taken before the leaders of the warband, the Daughters of Sorakel, a trio of enigmatic hags who claimed that the land west of the Grey Wall now belonged to them. The Barons would now be called Dram. The stubborn survivors were released to take this news east, along with an order that all Brelish forces beyond the Grey Wall must be pulled back, or else they would face the wrath of the hags and their army. The warning was not heeded by the Brelish, and when this news reached the town of Orkbone, the Westwind riders were mustered and rode out, never to return. The Dramish forces were quick to retaliate and raised Orkbone. The Brelish crown finally got the message. The barons were lost, at least for now. The next year, King Boronel ordered all Brelish citizens beyond the Grey Wall back. He did not have the resources to wage war on the Western Front as well, although he refused to recognize Dram's sovereignty, and Breland would continue to skirmish with Dramish forces on the border for the duration of the war. Little detail is known about the Daughter's rise to power, even by the denizens of Dram. By all accounts, the amount of organization and the size of their operation should have taken years, or even decades to plan and carry out, before we go further in-depth on the Daughters, let's talk about the past culture and history of the denizens of Dram. The barren lands were once an important part of the now-ruined Dakani Empire, with many of their ruins scattered amongst the Grey Wall Mountains, including thousand-foot statues of the kings that once united the Goblinoid Kingdom. It is thought that these lands may have been the original home of the Dakani Empire, once the Empire fell under attack by the Dalkir during the Age of Monsters, the land was quickly reclaimed by other forces that the Empire would have held at bay, such as the Orcs pushing in from the western swamps, Gnolls pushing down from the north, and Ogres descending from the mountains. Those few members of the Dakani that remained would have scattered and devolved, becoming the less sophisticated goblinoids that inhabit the monster nation in the present day. From then on, it was thousands of years of sheer anarchy, as the monster races competed for territory and resources. Kingdoms would rise and fall constantly under the leadership of warlords known as Chibs, a goblin term for chieftain or boss. A Chib was pretty much any creature that was large and mean enough to bully the lesser races into submitting to them, only to be overthrown again by someone meaner later down the track. Some more permanent bastions of civilization would arise during this time, such as the Zanir Pact, a brotherhood of Knoll mercenaries and the Venomous Domain, a secret city inhabited by tieflings and human outcasts, but these were few and far between. Supposedly, the Daughters of Sorakel appeared in 985YK and began brokering alliances with powers such as the Venomous Domain and the Zanir Pact, and soon after set out to subdue and dominate the many chibs that were controlling the barons. But this was only a year before Stubborn fell, which raises many questions. How did they manage to manufacture the weaponry and equipment carried by their armies in this time? Ogres and trolls are wild and undisciplined. How did they manage to drum in such regimented obedience and training in such a short period of time? There are many theories among Eastern academics. Some speculate that Sora Mena organized her armies many years or decades in the underground Dakani vaults deep below Dram, where they utilized ancient Dakani forges to create the equipment. One Brelish scholar has proposed the theory that Soramena's lair lies within Kyber itself and utilizes a demiplane that exists outside of the normal flow of time, allowing the sisters untold decades to plot their machinations. Thank you for watching guys, stay tuned for part 2 of this video where we'll take a closer look at the daughters of Sorakel themselves, as well as modern drama and its wide monster aspect. If you enjoyed this installment of Everon Historian, please hit those like and subscribe buttons below and turn notifications on so you're informed when a new episode comes out. 
You can find the most detailed information about Dram in Keith Baker's DM's Guild release, Exploring Eberron. If you would like to grab yourself a copy, please find my affiliate link in the description below. Baker's latest release, Chronicles of Eberron, is also available. If you like free battle maps or the music I use throughout this video, please swing by my Patreon. For the price of a coffee, you can pick up a monthly pack including D&D soundtrack I composed myself and a battle map to accompany it. As always, thank you to the loyal patrons who keep the channel lights on. I really appreciate it, guys. And I'll see you next time. <laughs>